Hello there and welcome back to the Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. Now last year I made the Mandragora gown out of this Mandragora colored silk from Silk Baron. This is a ribbed silk taffeta and I was very happy to finally make my dream sort of late Victorian early Edwardian costume here inspired by the film Crimson Peak and all things romantic gothic and a little bit creepy crawly due to my ongoing uh, fear and yet obsession with creepy crawlies done in sparkle. And after making that costume, I did end up with a little bit of leftover mandragora silk that I wanted to save for a special project, and the time has come. The plan is to go ahead and make this suit. I've sketched it up for you here, just like the first idea of this suit, a little nipped in and flared jacket with a shoulder pad, a small stand collar, and then a lot of embellishment on the shoulders and down the back, and then a kind of swishy taffeta skirt to go with that. But before I dove into the rest of my silk, because this color is sold out, I can't get any more of it. I only have what I have. I wanted to go ahead and make a mock-up. And in the tradition of this Mandragora project uh, sort of series, I ended up making a wearable mock-up out of a black polyester fabric, which is the same thing I actually did for the 1890s costume. So we're really just coming full circular. It's like poetry. It rhymes. But I'll show you what I got up to over on the blue patterning table of doom, as always. Here we are with some blank alphanumeric paper, of course. Put my sketch to the side here to keep me on track, and I will trace a copy of my bodice block front here. Again, if you need bodice blocks, if you don't have a uh, sloper or bodice and skirt block set yourself yet, I will link you to my playlist all about these sort of building blocks of making your own wardrobe, pattern drafting everything yourself. I'll put this um, pattern drafting basics playlist up ahead here. But I will raise the shoulder about a quarter inch up into the uh, shoulder tip and then extend it out that same quarter inch as well and then I'm going to decide how much of an overlap I want the front of this jacket to have and I think I'm going to go for about an inch and then I'll add on a half inch of seam allowance to that as well and then here's my apex can't really see what's going on here but I'll trace in my darts which we are going to eliminate into this neckline princess seam here like you see in the sketch um, and like I've been playing with recently and I actually really love the way this uh, princess seam works or fits or I don't know falls. So <laughs> I'm going to do that again. And I'll draw in my curved yoke up here as well. I made this a little too curvy up there. So I'll remedy that later on um, in the next version of this jacket. But I'll draw in my neckline here too. Just kind of decide what I want to do here. I drew in like a lower neckline first and then I raised it. And then later on, I actually lowered it down again. You'll see that at some point during the sewing. So I can start cutting this out. That way we can, we can start doing our dart manipulation. Oh, but I do want to add a eighth of an inch along the side seam here just for a tiny bit of ease and then I will lower the armhole again a quarter of an inch as well um, just again to create a tiny bit of ease within this jacket because of course I'll be wearing it over an underlayer either like a thin blouse or a thin like uh, undershirt like a t-shirt underneath this jacket of course something will be worn underneath so I need room to be able to wear that comfortably but I'll cut this out otherwise and I can cut up my waist dart to the apex here and from the side dart to the apex as well and then I will cut down my new princess seam style line here, like so. And then I can close this side dart, hinge that closed, tape that shut, and I will just trim off any excess here of the side seam, smooth that off. And then I'll trim off my waist dart because we don't need it at all anymore. And just like that, we have a princess seam bodice. We've eliminated our darts. You can see they're kind of still in there. You know, dart shaping is still what's making this work and fit the cone of the bust on my front. But it's just in a style line now instead of darts. And if you haven't seen my princess seam video all about this kind of modification, I will link that here as well. But because I've cut my pattern apart, I need to add seam allowance. So let me go ahead and do that along the style line. And then I will cut the yoke apart here from the side front and add seam allowance to that as well. Um, for those who are newer here, I actually on my block patterns, the card versions of my block patterns, I already have seam allowance added to the sides. So the only time I need to add seam allowance is when I cut into the interior of the pattern like this, adding a yoke, adding a style line, switching to princess seams, that's when I add seam allowance, but otherwise my patterns at the side seams, the shoulder seam, the waist, all already have seam allowance included. But I'm just labeling this Mandragora suit jacket, front yoke, side front and front here. Just drawing little arrows along the paper so I know my grain line on those things. And I can get started on the waist or like the peplum pieces for the front of the jacket. As you can see on the sketch here, if you look on the left, I have this front piece, the skirt portion of the jacket connects to the bodice. So you'll see me layer that up later. And then the side is a separate piece. So you'll see that here and how I make these two pieces. I've just used my pencil skirt pattern to draft a top of an A-line skirt there. If you've never seen that magic method of pivoting to make a A-line skirt, I also have that in my A-line skirt video. I can link that in the description below so I can preserve my last card. I'm sure I'll need it. But I've just added on that one and a half inch extension for the center front of my jacket here. Of course, this needs to overlap just like the rest of the top there. 
I'm trying to decide how far I want to come down, start sketching in the basic rough shape of this. Um, and I do need to, again, because this is my skirt block pattern, is what I started with here, I do have seam allowance up at the waist, so I'll sketch that seam allowance on in order to layer that other piece closed. But I'm just deciding what shape I want here for the bottom front of the jacket. And then at the side seam here, I will go ahead and just straighten that off. And I'm going to do that because it adds a little bit of flare here at the hip, which is nice and is what I have in my sketch. But I also want that to be a straight line because I'm going to connect the side front uh, peplum and the side back peplum together to create one piece later on. So I'll show you that too. Draw my grain line on, make sure I know what's happening here in this front extension and kind of, again, finessing this line. I am just making it up as I go, you know, trying to make my sketch come into reality here. And I'll begin cutting this out. Um, a little bit and my camera will cut out but here we are we're back and i can again grab my top bodice pieces here now these don't get taped together right along the line they get overlapped because again there's seam allowance in here so i'm going to draw that seam allowance on so i can see it same for this front piece as well and i will layer the top over the skirt piece here i'm just going to cut this in two for now so i have this seam allowance line and that's where i need to line this piece up with so go ahead and do that like so in the back as well and then this still needs seam allowance because I cut it apart from the other skirt piece. So this vertical style line needs seam allowance. So I'll put that on here, blend it into the seam allowance of the bodice piece, like so. And that little curve there is where my waist will be. And I can just secure that with some tape. So this is how we're looking so far. Now this piece in here needs to be a little bit flared to create this little, I don't know, tuck or a bit of extra flare here where these two pieces meet that I've decided in my sketch here. So I'm going to decide how much I want to do that with by folding the paper. Again, I'll draw in my seam allowance here and kind of get an idea of how these are going to match up, walk that seam and make sure everything is still on track. Just go ahead and line that up, make sure everything's okay. So I need, if I were just to sew this together right now, as it is, it would still fit me like an A-line skirt, but I'm adding this little pleat or little tuck here. And I decided to just fold the paper and play with it in paper form, pleating the paper down how I would like in order to get an idea of exactly the shape I wanted here. So I'm just kind of brainstorming with my hands here, sculpting the paper how I think I might want a pleat to be here. And I'm going to press this pleat, but not like uh, very, I'm not going to secure it in any way. I'm not going to, I don't know, um, make this a very strict pleat that has to be there. It's just going to more float away from the body and add to the kind of flared and bat wing effect of this whole jacket. So. Um, I'm not too worried about any of this, I don't know, being absolutely perfect. The general idea will be there. And I'm just deciding, what shape does my hem need to be? It needs to be pointed, just like on my Victorian jackets, honestly. If you've seen me do those Victorian costuming projects here before, this is a similar, you know, shape to the hem of this jacket as I've used on bodices for Victorian projects in the past. But to see how it's getting on, I'm going to go ahead and pin the seam allowance together along the stitching line and then fold that pleat in place to see what things are looking like. I still need to redo the hem of this. It's kind of curving uh, in the opposite direction of my sketch right now, so I need to make it curve upwards and follow this line of the front piece more. So I'll just straighten that off for now. And again, I'm just going to keep taping on paper and folding this and cutting it as I see fit in order to get the shape. This is more, you know, more of a creative flow <laughs> step in this, I'm trying to decide exactly what I want. Now we're getting better, but I did kind of want this to peak up and have a little dip. So this actually needs to be pointed. So I'll show you what it actually needs to look like. And you can skip all the finagling that I'm doing here and just draw on the little peak to start with. But I forgot that's what I needed to do to get the shape I wanted. Nearly there. We're getting there. Yes, there you go. Ah, we've arrived. Yes, like that. There we go. <laughs> that's what we need. And it's nice and pointy too, even when the pleat is not pressed down. Like I said, I'm going to leave these pleats kind of free flowing, so they're not going to be, I'll press them, but like just once, you know, but I'm just really finessing this line here as best I can as I go along in the flow of the pattern drafting of it all. And this is still a tiny bit too long. So, eh. you know, I will fold that back in place again. So I can get an idea of how this is looking pretty good. And taping down my floops on the back, of course, because I don't like to get my paper caught on stuff. It starts coming apart on me. But here's my jacket front, and I can start working on the jacket back and grab more paper here. And I've got a tracing of my back bodice block pattern here. I'm going to do the same shoulder modification, so raising that, tipping it up a quarter inch at the shoulder uh, tip, and then out 
bringing it out a quarter of an inch as well, then bringing that quarter inch of it down uh, at the underarm, at the under the arm seat, side, arm C, arm side, and then adding an eighth of an inch along the side seam. Just those same modifications I made to that kind of general area on the front bodice as well. And then I'm just using my front yoke as kind of a reference to get an idea of how big I made the yoke on the front to make the yoke on the back. I'm going to move this dart over about mm, five eighths of an inch, like so, uh, just from that back pivot point, just so I can have the exact narrowing princess seam that I want along the back here. Again, check out my princess seam video to see how to add princess style lines to garments, which is what I'm doing here. It's a princess seamed back with a yoke, of course. And I can go ahead and cut these pieces of art. You can see I do have a center back um, seam allowance for a half inch seam allowance back there. That's because I do want a center back seam on this garment. I could cut it on the fold, no problem, but I just decided that I wanted a seam just based on the different kinds of embellishment I wanted to do. I decided to keep a seam, but I'm gonna add seam allowance onto this princess seam. Again, uh, when I cut my pattern apart, I have to add seam allowance. You don't wanna forget that or you're gonna lose, you know, a whole inch and your garment will not fit. So that would be a bar. But add seam allowance to everything because once the, you know, once the pattern is cut apart, it has to go back together. So like so. All right, label again, Mandragora suit jacket, back yoke. Here's my grain line, Mandragora suit jacket, side back. There we go. And back. There we are. Like so. And now we need to do the skirt portion again. So again, I'm grabbing my pencil skirt back pattern. I'm just going to put an awl in the point of the dart, shift that dart closed. Next one, the same way. Again, I show this in my A-line skirt video. Um, this is just how to make a quick A-line skirt pattern. And of course, I'm only tracing the first like 10 inches of it because I'm making a peplum-ish uh, kind of. I'm just making the lower portion of this jacket as opposed to an actual A-line skirt. Draw on my seam allowance again so I can layer this back piece, just like I had done to the front. This back at the waist, there's no waist seam in the central panel. And here I'm drawing this from the seam allowance when I need to draw it from the style or like the stitching line. There we go. That's better. Like so. I'll grab another pen so I can confirm this for us. Like here. Yes. Just flaring that out. Making sure this is overlapped perfectly. Although, you know, being a sixteenth of an inch off isn't going to make a huge dramatic difference. At least not to me. But draw in the shape for the back of my jacket here, the swallowtail-ish effect. If you've seen the 18th century swallowtail jackets, you know what I mean. They have this little pointed back on them, which is used quite often in historic costuming. And I like doing it on all kinds of clothes, including this slightly vintage slash antique inspired modern jacket. Uh, you know, I don't know what era this jacket is from. I think it might be from 2022, you know. For the side back of like the peplumish piece here, I'm going to again connect it to the side front here. So I'm just drawing in my seam allowance again along that straight line, and then I can overlap that stitching line on top of stitching line and tape that closed, which is why I wanted to have that straight line at the hip, A for flare, B so I can layer it closed like this and have one side peplum piece as opposed to having, um, you know, having to have a seam there. I could put a seam in there, but in doing the flare, I don't have to, I can eliminate it if I want to. So cut some of this out here, get an idea. And I need to add seam allowance along that style line here. So I'll do that. Um, but you can see I left about a two inch pleat along the, from the waist down along the center back, just to again, have a little pleat from the center of the waist down to the hem. Um, I actually am going to leave that open, I think in the next version of this jacket, but today I will do it as a pleat. So you'll see me try and fuss around with that later. Um, but add seam allowance here. And then again, I want to add that same kind of flare and pleat here between the two panels like I did on the front. So again, I will end up pleating the paper and making a mess of the whole thing while I figure out what shape this needs to be. I hope all of you are having a good autumn prep season so far still been quite hot, but today it was nice and rainy and even a little bit thundery. Perfect. I love me some autumn weather. I always lament that in this world, on this planet we currently live on, um, you can move somewhere where it's always winter. You know, you can move some sort of Arctic circle kind of place. You can move somewhere where it's always summer, the Bahamas, etc. But you cannot move somewhere where it is always fall. And that is a bummer. I think as close as you can get is probably like, I don't know, drearier areas of Scotland or maybe in Seattle but even then the trees aren't orange all the time so I just wish there was an environment where it could be fall all the time 
If you know of such magical places somewhere here on Earth, do let me know. You know, I just want it to be fall always. It's not fair that you can have summer or winter, but you can't have fall. And I was thinking to myself, oh, you know, if everything goes knock on wood according to plan, next year in fall I might possibly have moved to the East Coast. It could happen. We're thinking positive thoughts here. Um, and if that's true, I want to make sure I go see the fall color here in Colorado for like the possibly last time. And then I realized if I move to the East Coast, it's not like I'm going to lose fall color. I'm going to gain a lot of fall color. So I don't know why I'm worried about that. So I'm just planting my pleat here on the center back, making sure that works. Yes, should be fine with that two inches. And then here I've just added on, again, that little triangle peaked bit of flare. Again, just have to perfect that peak here still. Walking these seams, making sure everything lines up and uh, overlaps the way I want it to. Again, just figuring this all out the same way I did on the front, folding the paper until I liked what I saw. And here is the side peplum now. I've taped the front onto the back, and it's all one piece now. And everything should hopefully fit like this. This is, again, a tiny bit long. Yes, trim that down, child, please. But otherwise, it should be fine. There we go. Walked that seam, figured out I didn't need this paper. Goodbye. But now here is my back pattern. I got the yoke, the side. This will match up along the side seam, of course, to my front side piece like that. The skirt goes here. This front piece goes here. And we have my jacket pattern. Now for the sleeve for this, I am just going to trace my standard block sleeve here. This is the long sleeve. I actually have a video on how to draft this sleeve as well. Um, so I can link that in the description as well here. But I'm going to uh, connect the underarm area here, like the sleeve cap, I suppose, with a straight line. Then I'm going to come out two inches from this uh, either side of the center of the sleeve and draw in little uh, angled lines down to the center of the sleeve. You can see what I mean, because um, clearly I cannot explain it, so that's a shame. And I'm going to cut down these marks and the center as well, and then cut over to the underarm on either side as well, because we're going to add a little bit of flare in here, because I just want to puff the very top of this sleeve a little bit. I don't want to add volume to the rest of the sleeve. I just want to add a little bit of volume up here at the top. I didn't want to do like a large puff sleeve with this, because I felt, I felt like it might make this garment look too 1980s to do that, um, with a large like leg of mutton kind of 1890s sleeve on this. It would end up looking a little 1990s, I thought. So I'm just going to add a tiny bit of puff here at the top, and this bit of flare is how I do that. I'm bringing this up again at the top of the cap a quarter of an inch as well. But this is just how you can add a little bit of flare to the top of your sleeve. I'm going to make a video in the next six months. <laughs> it's on my calendar for January currently. We'll see how things get moved around um, just on different styles of puff sleeves. So that will be coming eventually here as well. But Mandragora suit jacket sleeve. Got that as set aside. Just tape down a few more of my floops before things get ripped and caught on anything. Yes, I do th go through a lot of tape down here. It's an occupational hazard, but here's my jacket pattern. I can start cutting that out. I'm going to cut this out of a black polyester um, shantung fabric. Shantung is like a taffeta. It's just got a little bit of slubs in it. Shantung is like in between. If you think of taffeta as a perfectly smooth silk and dupioni as like a slubbed, more raw looking silk, uh, shantung is kind of in between. So it has slubs, but it's still a lot smoother. It's less of an organic look than Dupioni, but still not perfectly smooth like a taffeta is. So I really like Shantung, actually. I haven't worked with Silk Shantung before, but I quite like this polyester Shantung. It's very lightweight, and, and because it is very lightweight, you can see here I am layering all of my pieces with black muslin. So I'm interlining this jacket the same way I would my Victorian costumes, actually. Um, one step closer to learning how to do tailoring, <laughs> backing the Shantung with muslin here. It just happens to be black muslin, uh, cotton muslin fabric. I'm going to run all those edges through the serger to flatline this. Usually when I'm doing costuming, I will go ahead and hand baste all the edges, but just because I'm making a modern garment today instead, I'm going to go ahead and run them through the serger. And once those pieces are flatlined, I can start constructing a few things here. So I have my center back of my outer layer of the jacket. I'm going to go ahead and pin down the center back of both the jacket itself and then the little pleated pebble me section. And then the little angle in between at the waist here. This doesn't get sewn shut, so this will stop here at this little zone and it'll just be sewing the straight lines. I don't sew around that corner. Um, hopefully you'll see what I mean later. Same sort of thing here for the lining. I did cut the lining uh, of this jacket. It's going to be fully lined. The lining I cut out of this purple sort of uh, jacquarded rayon lining from Mood Fabrics. Here I'm going to sew my front yokes to my front pieces. That's what I'm doing here. But um, the lining I cut the center front 
um, panel pieces and the side peplum pieces. I cut the lining out of the shantung as well so it would match. You'll see that later. But here I am sewing these first bits together. Again, see at this corner I'm stopping and I'm coming off the machine and then I'm going to do the other straight portion. So these are parallel seams. I'm not sewing that uh, horizontal seam in between because I will need to press this pleat open later. And if I sew it shut, that would be quite difficult. I do just have black all-purpose polyester Guterman thread here on the machine over here on the 99K and half inch seam allowance as always. And you see I'm sewing over my silk pins as I always tend to do. Um, you know, me and my machine, again, have a blood pact and uh, we get along fine doing it this way. You do what works for you, you know? Or, you know, sew over pins at your own risk. Uh, you know, I don't uh, recommend you do it, but I certainly do do it, you know? Take those pins out here. I've just sewn my front yokes onto the front side pieces and then those backs for both the lining and the fashion fabric. Move those pins aside, start clipping any curves and pressing anything that I need to. Press this center back like so. I didn't even sew the lower part of these um, pleat closed because I wasn't exactly sure how I wanted to finish this, so I'll leave that for later. And this lining is quite fun. It's very iridescent looking, especially with my green LED lights on here in the studio. Of course, me and my colorful lighting, always making things look extra iridescent because, you know, if I could make all things iridescent, I might, honestly. We all know how I love iridescence and shiny things. I'm a bit of a Corvid in that way. Can't help it. But yes, clipping my curves here on those yokes. This yoke is quite curvy, and even in my sketch, it wasn't as curved as this. So I did end up straightening this off a little bit on the pattern as one of my modifications before I made the next jacket. But just set those aside for now. All this lining stuff. Because I'm thinking, what do I want to do next? Which portion of this? Basically, I was doing as much as possible before I had to do the bound buttonholes down the front of the jacket. So I was doing every step I possibly could before jumping into those bound buttonholes. Because we know I have a history of slightly messing up bound buttonholes here on the channel. Usually I can do them fine on the outer layer. It's just the lining that trips me up. So we'll see if I can manage to do it properly today. So yes, we will have bound buttonholes in a moment here. But let me get the rest of the jacket as many steps as I can before those buttonholes come into come into play. And you can see here how I'm going to press this pleat here in the center back for the peplum area, the skirt of the jacket, I suppose. It's just easier to call it a peplum. It's not really a peplum. It's just the lower part of the jacket, but eh, whatever. Like so. And now we have this little pleat back here, nice and crispy in this fabric. Again, a lightweight poly shantung like this. This one I can link below is from moodfabrics.com. It was in my stash for a project that I didn't get to last year, and now it's being used for this instead. So, oh well. Sometimes that does happen. If it's in the stash, it's fair game, honestly. I'm just going to cut triangles out along this curved seam here so I can press it open and flat as possible. Again, this was rather a curvy seam. Um, and again, because I have two layers of fabric here, it was a little trickier. So it's a tiny, tiny bit puckered, but we're just going to press it into submission. And then once I top stitch this, actually it laid a lot flatter. So that's good. This is the peril of doing such a curvy seam here. What was I thinking? So yes, over here on the machine, I will just do some top stitching on this curved yoke seam. This is actually the only area of this I did top stitching on. I know I'm usually a frequent top stitcher, uh, but this garment will be fully lined, so I didn't feel the need to top stitch down every seam. Um, but I just wanted to see if I could get this any smoother. So I went ahead and did some top stitching on that using the narrow side of my presser foot as a guide as per usual for me. And now I'm thinking about how can I sew next, but I can't sew this uh, side back to the back yet because it doesn't have the skirt portion. So I need to sew my side seams of the side front and side back together first, funny enough. And then I can sew the skirt onto this and then I can sew the back princess seam. Hopefully this makes sense. It's just one of those things where I was like, I'll do this next and oh no, order of operations says incorrect kid. You have to do the side seams first. So I'll go ahead and sew those real fast. Of course, the side seams are the simplest part of this. Nice straight line, nine inch long little seam, very quick. This jacket did take me two very full days to make uh, total, but you know, I, I wouldn't recommend trying to do it in two days unless you're a wild person like me who thinks that, who doesn't understand time, honestly, and calendars and scheduling. <sighs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm taking a rest day tomorrow, actually. I'm very excited about it because I've been working on all this stuff here that you'll see the rest of the month in kind of a marathon of sewing for the last week and a half. And I need a break. But just pressing open those side seams using my clapper a little bit when I remember it is always near at hand and yet I still usually use my hands as we all know so it's a shame but true but now that I have my side seams sewn I can sew those side peplum pieces onto that let me grab those 
like so. Again, all of this is interlined with muslin. Everything on the outer layer is interlined with muslin except for the center front pieces. And I'll show you why that is later when we get to the buttonholing of it all, because I decided to use interfacing on those instead of interlining. Interlining, interfacing, eh. I did have a couple of questions about interfacing recently here on the channel, um, about like what my preferences are and like how I know which interfacing to use. I just buy lightweight fusible of various kinds. I don't really, I just like throw it in the cart and don't even really analyze it. And I keep it around here and I use it mostly for waistbands. So I just kind of grab whatever's around. Like I'm, I'm not very, I'm not an expert in it, sadly enough. Something again that I will have to learn more about if I ever get better at tailoring as opposed to dressmaking, which are kind of two different crafts. Um, they're similar and overlapping, but tailoring involves a lot more know-how when it comes to sculpting garments and using interlayers, interlinings, interfacings um, to achieve desired result. But I'm, I'm dipping my toe into the arena. We'll see how it goes. And because this waist seam between the peplum area and the side seam is rather curvy, I'm going to go ahead and clip all that and press it open over here so that everything will be nice and smooth. Like so, always clip your curves, all right? Unless it's a very shallow curve or a very loosely woven fabric, you gotta be clipping your curves. But now I have this back princess seam all ready to go and I can stitch this to the center back piece now. Now that the skirt is on and these will match up and be the same length, we can do it all in one long seam. If I could, you know, line these up correctly. Come on, kid. You could put notches at the waist of these pieces and then it would be a lot easier to match them up. But I literally never use notches because I'm a naughty person, so. Sorry. You know, there are places I cut corners, as we know. If you've been here a while, you know the areas where I choose to spend a ton of time and the areas where I choose to cut corners can be very strange. <laughs> so I'm going to do nice bound buttonholes on this. I'm going to do a lot of detailing on the back of this jacket later, but I'm not going to put notches on my pattern. <laughs> so, you know. But just stitching that with half inch seam allowance again over here on the machine. And because this is a curvy, curvy seam, I need to cut out notches, at least of this, <laughs> little triangles along my curves and clips into my curves at the waist. You know, concave curves need clips, convex curves need triangles clipped out. Just, you know, to make everything lie as smooth as possible. That's best practice, I suppose. And I do get a lot of questions about clipping curves and like, doesn't that mean that it will fray and stuff like that? Yes, technically kind of, but the alternative being like you are weakening the fabric a tiny bit at that spot, but it shouldn't get a ton of tension and it will be fully lined. So I'm not worried about it at all here, but in garments that aren't lined, I would top stitch from the outside just to give that a little bit of extra stability. Um, but the alternative to clipping your curves is a very bunchy, unfortunate looking seam. So rather it be a little bit weaker and at least look nice than be completely bunchy and sad, which is unfortunate, you know, but with all that pressed, I can go ahead and do the other side here. And then we have to start doing the buttonholes. It's time. So here I have some silk organza from, I think this is from Mood actually. I'm just gonna cut out like three inch by three inch triangles of that to use for doing my windows for my bound buttonholes. Um, I like to do bound buttonholes uh, with like all, everything being a separate piece of fabric. Um, some You can do bound buttonholes in a different way where you kind of fold everything into place but that's just much more difficult to me. I like doing it this way. It does mean there's an extra layer of fabric in here, but so be it, because it, for me, this is how I can get them to look clean and nice. And that's what we're after here. But I am just ironing on, again, some random fusible interfacing to the inside of my front pieces here, where I will have um, buttons on one side and button holes on the other. And um, you can see I lowered the neckline just a tiny bit, um, and I didn't uh, recut the fronts until I put the interfacing on here. And I was like, oh yeah. But I'm just marking, I marked on my pattern piece where I wanted my buttons. Again, trying to keep buttons across the bust area. And at, like I, I put one button at the bust and one button at the waist first. And then I find the other two basically uh, equidistant because to me having a button at the waist is important and having one at the bust is important to keep the jacket from gaping um, because I do wear things that are quite fitted. I only added that tiny bit of ease in this jacket. So I knew it was gonna be quite fitted. So that's kind of how I do button spacing. I don't have an official formula. It's just like, make sure there's a button at the waist, make sure there's a button at the bust and then figuring out everything else in between. Now I have on my little pieces of organza drawn 
a buttonhole box here. Um, these are a quarter inch by an inch and an eighth. I'm using one inch buttons for this. So I have an extra inch, eighth of an inch of space for the width of the button, basically. Um, you, I probably should have used, technically, I think it's supposed to be the width of the button plus the length of the button. Mine's a little bit under that, but this boxy shape means it's got no trouble fitting the buttons through there. But I'm lining up those boxes over where I need my buttonholes, my finished buttonholes to be here. And I'm just pinning those, trying to make them straight as possible uh, without getting too, too meticulous about it. Um, I am doing a lot of this by eye because again, I am lazy. Then over here on the machine, I can stitch around these boxes. So I'm stitching on that. This is colored pencil line here. You could use chalk. We all know how I like to use colored pencil in my sewing. I, I'm not even apologetic anymore about it. Um, but I'm stitching around this box using a small stitch length. Definitely use a small stitch length for something like this. I'm using 12 stitches per inch here. I'm trying to keep things as straight and tidy as possible. I'm starting in the middle of the long side of the box. Um, and then I, instead of back stitching at any point, I'm just going to overlap where I started a little bit. Um, again, this is not going to receive a ton of tension in the end. You would think buttonholes receive a lot of tension, but this particular spot on them is not. So should be okay. But I'll just go around all the boxes here for all four of my buttonholes. And once I have those boxes sewn, I need to cut it in this little pattern here. So I need to slice down the middle and then cut triangles into the corners. It's very important that you cut these this way in this little formation because you will need all this seam allowance. If you can call that tiny, tiny little triangles and narrow uh, strips seam allowance. Um, but I need all of that in order to sew the next step of my buttonhole process. So just being careful to cut these in that pattern. Then I can push my windows of organza through. Those were sewn on the outside of the fabric, you'll notice. And I'm pulling them to the inside here because I need the finished windows to be on the outside of my garment. But I will go ahead and press these windows open like so. And uh, having this be interfaced instead of interlined, um, interlining wouldn't be fused to the fabric. Um, so having a looser layer in here might be kind of a nightmare, I thought. So I, that's why I went with the fusible instead for this front piece and hoped that it would uh, end up a similar weight to the inner um, lined pieces. Even I'm going to get confused here. Now I have two pieces, again, of like three inch by three inch little bits of scrap shantung here. And I'm going to sew those with the line down the middle. So I have these little butterflies or what are going to be the lips of my bound buttonholes here. I'm just going to press those. I actually stitch those with a very large stitch length so I can uh, unpick them later because um, they're just basted shut now with a large stitch length. So I can remain basted shut until the very end of this project where I will finally unpick them. But for now, it's best to have them closed. But I'm going to pin. I'm like lining up underneath in the window, lining up so the, the seam line, mm -hmm, the basting line between the two lips of fabric uh, is centered in each of these windows. And then I'm going to need to sew uh, all that little tiny seam allowance from cutting the window down to this layer. Oh no, these are one of those things that are just very hard to explain and very nerve wracking to sew. I will link a blog post below from Laura um, of Lilacs and Lace because she is an excellent seamstress and has an excellent blog post about how to do bound buttonholes. Um, so you, I will link both of her blog posts that I've seen about bound buttonholes because that's how I learned to do them. So follow her advice, seeing as I'm kind of a mess as usual. But yes, you pin them in place and you fold each side back and stitch down the seam allowance of cutting the window to the lip layer of fabric. God, this makes no sense. I do have another video where I made bound buttonholes. Maybe I can put that in a card here, but I do mess it up in that video. But watching me explain this again, maybe I explained it better back then. I don't know. You can see I'm sewing the long side of this. I do the two short sides first and then the two long sides of this. Sewing down as straight as I can, like so, and as close to like the opening of the box as I can. And then we have a bound buttonhole. Oh my goodness, and it's all stitched down. It's still stitched closed. And eventually I will go with these buttons. I couldn't really decide. I had a couple options, but I went with these in the end. But yes, I did all three other buttonholes the same exact way. And then I just kind of cut the seam allowance away afterwards. I find it easier to work with larger squares and then just cut them down after everything's done because, you know, the less fabric you have to hold on to while you're doing it, it's kind of annoying. And you can always cut it away later, but you can't add anything on. So 
I just start with larger squares and then cut this down. And here I am just pinning and repinning and rethinking what I need to do, <laughs> which side I need to put my windows on for this Shantung. Because again, in my other video, if you click over to that one, I do the lining for my buttonholes wrong. And this time I was determined to get it right. So I'm transferring over where they need to be here onto the lining layer of Shantung. Again, this garment is going to be lined in that purple lining, but on the center front panels, I used the same Shantung. So, you know, they're faced basically in the same fabric. And I made my windows for my lining here a little bit bigger. That way, if they weren't exactly precisely in the right spot, which they definitely are not, then I would have a little bit of wiggle room or window room, as it were, here to make sure that this lined up with the buttonholes in the back. Oof. But I made these an inch and a half long and five eighths of an inch wide, which is much bigger than my inch and an eighth by quarter inch buttonholes themselves. But just give me a little bit of wiggle room for the back and everything will be hand stitched eventually. You'll see what I mean. But I just sewed those boxes the same way and then pushed my excess organza to the back. Again, this ends up with a lot of organza in here. Silk organza is quite strong though, so it's kind of nice to have this here as an extra layer in my buttonholes, again, giving them a little bit of stability. Although I'm trying to learn to put ease into my jacket patterns so that I don't have to put a lot of stress on my buttonholes. We all know how I like to make close fitting clothes though. It's just who I am. But I'll press down my windows like so, which happen to be on the correct side of the Shantung. Celebrate with me. <laughs> I'm so glad. I had a lot of bound buttonholes to do the last couple of weeks. And by a lot, I mean eight of them, but eight is asking a lot. And this video today, by the way, when I dropped all my footage in and put it up to 250 times speed, which is my like standard uh, extra speed that I use in my videos, this video uh, originally was two and a half hours long. And I know some of you would have liked me to keep it two and a half hours long, but I did was able to cut it down um, just because I don't think I can talk for that long. And my voice is already getting tired and we're only at 40 minutes in. So we'll see how it goes. Now I sewed that center front of this just to get an idea. Uh, the piece with the buttons, the piece with the buttonholes and the piece with the windows. I sewed them together and then I'm just gonna cut the, um, or trim the seam allowance down there because it's gonna poke through to my windows. But I just wanted to make sure that this worked. <laughs> um, you don't really need to do this at this step, but uh, I went ahead and lined this piece basically um, along the center front. This would technically be done this, I don't know, seam here along the center front next to the buttons would be done when I bag line the jacket later otherwise, but I just really wanted to make sure I had got this right. Um, and you can see my clean windows line up with my clean buttonholes and I will hand stitch around those. And I'm very pleased about it. But I'll just pin this and set this piece aside for a moment here. Victorious, go have a piece of chocolate to celebrate, etc. But yes, we do need to continue making the lining. Uh, where we left off, I had just sewn the yokes on, so I need to sew the side seams before I can sew the peplum onto this. And again, the peplum for this I cut out of Shantung, so you'll see it's a bit of a contrast. But that's just because, again, the only other place where I expected to be able to, you know, if the wind blew a little bit, the skirt of this could flap around and I wanted it to be black on the inside as well. Not that this purple isn't pretty, because it is definitely quite pretty. I had this left over from lining a project last year. I didn't buy any fabric specifically to make this mock-up, which you know, it's always good if you can just make some stuff out of the stash. But yes, here are my Shantung peplum lining pieces here that I'm attaching to the rest of the lining. Once again, I had to attach the side seam and then the side peplum pieces before I could sew the back princess seams. So same order of operations that I used on the outside layer for the inside lining layer here, including clipping this curve and pressing it open like so. Of course, these things press very well. The rayon lining presses very nicely. And rayon lining is usually slippery and annoying to work with, but the jacarded ones like this, where it has like a pattern woven into the weave, are actually a little bit more stable and nicer to use. So that's handy as well. But once I have my side back and center back of my lining pieces together, again, I had to clip those curves and press that open. And I'll do the other side the same way here, like so. And then we have my back yokes. I sewed those on as well. Again, a curved seam. So I will go ahead and clip and press that. But I think you'll agree that this lining is quite nice. No? I really like their round jacquard linings over at Mood. They have some really pretty ones. They are a little bit pricier though, so I don't all I don't always indulge, of course. But uh, when I can, I like it. So all my lining is together now, except for the front pieces are not on here, which is the same for my outside of my jacket as well. So so for my right hand side of my jacket when I'm wearing it, 
um, which is like the opposite side of the lining, it's very confusing, um, is where I have the buttonholes and button windows, basically. So this is the other side. This is the left-hand side of my jacket. It's just going to have a solid piece of the shantung as the lining layer. And this side will eventually be sewn to the interfaced plain front uh, outside layer where the buttons will go. So my button hole side on the right hand side of my garment is a little bit more complex. And then over here, I just have a smooth piece. So I can go ahead and sew that now to my lining. Oh, it's hard to keep track of unless you've made a jacket before, in which case you're like, yeah, it's fine. But explaining how to fully line things and when you're bag lining it is kind of annoying because everything is reversed in some ways because the you have to have it so that the right sides are facing out in the end and that the sides with all the seam allowance and goop face each other. So it all gets sandwiched kind of weird in the end. And here on my outside layer, I hadn't sewn on my back yokes yet, so I'll do that. Again, curved seams, so I'll have to clip it. But hopefully you understand what I mean <sighs> when it comes to lining this buddy. I might need to make a whole video all about how to line something that's a little bit more slowed down and specific for those who are new to fully lining garments. Oftentimes when I'm making stuff, I use just use facings, but um, when I'm making something a little bit more, you know, attempting at couture here, I'm going to uh, go ahead and fully line. And I am sewing these little darts over here. These are my elbow darts in my sleeves. So I have three layers for the sleeves. I have this purple lining layer. I have my muslin interlining layer um, to flat line my outer sleeve fabric. Um, and so then I have this shantung layer. So I'm going to layer the shantung and the muslin layer together, just like I did for the rest of the garment. I just sewed the darts separately just because there's these tiny little darts and I didn't want anything to get too bulky and weird when I was trying to sew them together. Um, so I have my muslin layer that I will line up with the inside of my shantung layer. I will surge around the raw edges of that just like I did for the rest of the garment. And then I have my purple sleeve lining, which does peek out a tiny bit at the cuffs when I move around, which is quite fun because purple and black are a good combo in my book. But I'll just line up my shantung and muslin layers, throw those through the serger, and then I can sew the underarm seams for both the black layer, outer layer, and the purple lining, like so, over here on the machine. Update on the faceplate situation for this. As many of you told me, my planar faceplate, which you can't see right here, it's on the other side of the needle area of this machine, it just has like striped chromed piece, um, is the original piece for this machine, which has its more like art deco kind of styling of the decals on this machine because this machine is from the mid 1950s. Um, earlier 99Ks, earlier Singer machines have a floral faceplate. And I was saying that I admired that floral faceplate and someone has actually sent me one. So I haven't received it yet, but I am very excited about it. And I know some people will be mad if I switch it <laughs> because you are purists. And I understand. It's not like I'll throw the other one away. I'll keep it. And then hopefully eventually I will have another 99K that can have the floral faceplate. And then I'll have this one, which has the original because, you know, eventually I do plan on becoming one of those monsters who has like eight sewing machines. I just don't have the space for it yet. And by monsters, I mean, I envy you, you know, I'm sticking my faux little stuffed arm that I made out of spare yarn here once <laughs> ironing tools inside my sleeve so I can press open the underarm seam now that that is sewn. And of course I need to put my gathering stitching into the sleeve cap as well. So I will put that. I am making the sleeves at this point in the process because I plan to put the sleeves into the outside of the garment and the sleeves into the lining here before I put the lining and the jacket together. Um, so I want to have the arm side of each completely smooth on the inside. So I'd rather turn the cuffs last and have the sleeves already set in when it comes to lining this garment. Again, hopefully that makes any sense as I always say, because I feel like I am a rambling mess, but apparently some of you understand me. So thank you. Um, and I will go ahead and set my purple sleeves into my purple lining and my black sleeves into my outside of my jacket as well here. And the nice thing about having any puff in your sleeve is any discrepancy between the size of these things is solved by the fact that there's a little bit of ease, extra ease available due to the gathering at the top here. But I was just concentrating my gathers to like the top two inches around the center of my shoulder cap here, spacing out my gathers as need be. But I have had requests before for like a specific video about like how to set in sleeves or about sleeve patterns and stuff like that because I think people have trouble with sleeves um but my I have no trouble with sleeves so I almost don't know like what to like I don't know how to make that video in some way because it's like I don't have any trouble with them uh, my whenever I set in sleeves it just works this is possibly because my pattern is like custom you know fit uh, so 
my sleeve pattern is drafted based on my bodice pattern. So there is no discrepancy between the arm sia on either. They are designed to fit together and pattern drafted by me for my, like for each other. Uh, so like there is no problem, I suppose. Um, I don't know if maybe commercial patterns have uh, more of a problem with this, but because my patterns are drafted to fit together, they do. And therefore I don't have a lot of like knowledge about troubleshooting because I don't have to troubleshoot. Hopefully that makes sense. But once my sleeves are set in, once again, on the uh, button side, not the buttonhole side, the left-hand side of my garment, that is uh, the smooth side, as it were, the non-buttonhole side, I can go ahead and sew my front to my side front. Oh, heavens. This will make more sense when I make the Mandragora silk version of this, because I did this in a different order for that jacket. But here, I kind of, you know, did some things weird, because I had sewn that uh, windows side of the buttonhole side to the buttonholes, just to double check first. Um, so I kind of sewed that right hand side out of order, which means this whole thing is like shifted over one piece. Meh. But I'll just stitch that princess seam on the front of my left hand side of my garment here, and I will clip over my bust curve, clip into my waist curve, and press all this open. Get it as smooth as I can here. I am very excited for some of my other spooky projects I have coming up, although this jacket itself I think in the end you will agree is quite a way to kickstart autumn sewing um, and I look forward to wearing it quite a lot but I have some other fun projects coming up this month including a, a lace fabric with spider webs that are sometimes flocked and sometimes sequined as an overlay on an orange cocktail dress that's coming up so look forward to that perhaps I do have a uh, costuming project coming up in October as well and then there might be a Halloween lookbook you know <clears throat> kind of do those yearly so I have some preparations and things to get in order for those bigger projects coming up in October and so to prepare to give myself time to work on all of that I decided to do a giant suiting project this month I don't know what's wrong with me scientists say they just aren't sure but of course this is my favorite season and I did reward myself uh, for completing this series of projects yesterday by when I went to go pick up <clears throat> my prescription at the pharmacy, I decided to go to Target and check out the Halloween stuff. And I may have picked up a few candle holders and a spiderwebbed blanket as a, a treat for having finished these projects. And we all know how I love Halloween stuff, so it's hard for me to stay away. Okay, so here's my garment. I have actually sewn both the princess seams on the outside layer here. This right-hand side just has its lining already attached. So I'm going to attach the lining uh, to that piece there. Hopefully this makes sense, like so. So do this princess seam between the inner side, the inner lining side of the right hand side of the garment and the rest of the lining. Dang it, this makes no sense. Once again, hopefully the visuals make more sense than I do. And I know I always get comments saying, don't worry, you do make sense. But I, I really do worry each and every time that I've lost the plot, as it were. Just pinning along that princess seam and the lining right sides together, of course, while doing this. So I have my lining and my jacket starting to go together here finally. Do need to press this seam though because it is again a curvy princess seam. So clipping and pressing necessary. Slightly off camera here. Dang it. Wish I had a bat shaped pin dish for this spookier time of the year. Things to look forward to perhaps in the future. If I were to ever do merch, having a pin dish with like a magnet on the bottom, perhaps. Wouldn't be a bad idea, honestly. I think of strange merch options, like having pin dishes or like doing uh, paintings and then having silk scarves made with my artwork on them. I don't think of nice, easy to do or cheap to do merch ideas. It's only ever dreaming of quite spectacular nonsense things to do. Maybe one day. So here I will sew the other side. I can sew the center fronts. Ooh. Because that buttonhole side, I had wanted to see the windows. I had this seam already done, but over here I need to do it. And then we will have right sides together of my lining, all ready to go, and I need to do the bottom edge of this as well. So basically bag lining the rest of this. The other side was weird. At this point, I can just bag line it. I'm sewing the, um, I'm putting the right sides of the jacket and the lining together and pinning all along the bottom edge, like the hem of the peplum until I get to the back, <laughs> until I get to the center back where 
my purple lining you'll notice is still open and that's because I'm going to stop at the center back here and then figure that out because of the pleat uh, on the inside in a separate way. So I'm going to stop and start at the center back here, um, but you'll see how I finish that when we get to the inside. It will look a bit of a mess, but it will finish cleanly, so no worries, I promise. But just lots of lining these different points and seams up for the lining and outer layer, all right sides together, so I can bag line this buddy. The baddie jacket, the ba baddie backed jacket, but really we should just say baddie backed blazer because then it's really alliterative and that's fun. I'm just stitching that all over here on the machine. Again, once I get to a corner, I leave the needle down, pick up the presser foot, move the project, put the presser foot back down. That's how I get around both the pointed and inverted pointed areas. And again, I'm going to stop here at the center back, come off the machine, come back on. Then I need to clip all of my corners, all of my curves, etc., etc. So I'm doing that here. I really should have understitched this uh, bottom edge as well. I didn't do it here on this black version, but I will end up doing it in the silk version later. You'll see in a couple weeks from now when we get to that jacket. Because whew, this has been a time consuming project to do. Uh, a it's a total of four pieces. So today we have this black jacket. Next week I'll have two taffeta skirts, uh, one to coordinate with this jacket. It doesn't match, but it is orange and this is black. So it's a perfect Halloween outfit. And then I'll make the silk mandragora um, colored skirt as well. And then after that, we will have the jacket. So one giant four piece project this month. But now I can turn everything right side out and start, you know, ironing everything into submission, poking all my corners out now that they've been clipped making sure all my curves are smooth, using my tailor's ham um, and clapper when needed to make sure that this is all pressed smoothly now that it is finally starting to look like a jacket. The nice thing about doing those bound buttonholes is usually when I do buttonhole garments, I do the buttonholes last. And this, it's like I, when I finish with everything, all the sewing, the buttonholes are already done. Huh. So I just have to sew the buttons on, which is nice. And then of course do all the embellishment I'm planning to do down the back of this, but you'll see that in a minute. Just using my knitting needle to poke out corners here carefully. Um, you don't want to poke through them, but you do want to have nice sharp corners, of course. This neckline ended up being a tiny bit wide. I think I'll bring it in a tiny bit for the silk version later. You'll see that later when we get to that. But I'm just, again, this edge here even, this is the um, left-hand side of the jacket on the front. I could have understitched that as well. You know, it's always best practice to do understitching where possible. Sometimes corners and curves make it hard to get understitching in there, and that's fair enough. But on these longer, straighter seams, I should have done it. I'll be honest. I feel slightly regretful, but not enough to like open up the lining and get in there and do it again. You know, that's silly. <laughs> but just pressing all of this stuff. Hear it, 1,000 times speed, by the way. I wish I was this fast at doing this. Well, oh, but look, we have a jacket. Oh, and you know what we're gonna need eventually here? A collar. Yeah, that's an idea. I'm just pleating those pleats in the front. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to like really steam or like block these into submission. I'm just giving them a little press here and I'll just leave them pinned while they cool just to give the indication of a pleat there. Of course, this if, if this flares completely open, it looks quite fun and pointed and dagged anyway, so I don't mind. But just pinning into my tailor's ham here. It's the nice thing about having one of those. Pin right into it. Give this a lot of steam, although this is mostly polyester. I mean, the lining is rayon and the inner lining is cotton but they all kind of press a little bit differently. So I find this shantung doesn't press too poorly. It holds a crisp edge pretty well. Like so. All right, just keep those pinned again while it cools. Kind of the same principle as I use when I do my hair, honestly. Usually when I'm doing my hair, if you watch my old, old hair tutorials here on the channel, which I haven't made any new ones because I haven't changed any of my techniques, honestly. And I still have the same haircut that I had like three years ago. So, um, but, uh, you'll see that I will take the curls off the curling iron and then I roll them back up and pin them to my head to, uh, like cool. And it just helps it keep like it while it's losing that heat, it like sets in place. Same principle with fabric as it is with curls in the hair. All right. So this back area of the lining where I had left it open, this is because I did the pleat on the lining differently than the outside. Like the outside has that pleat and then here in the lining, I just didn't bother to do it the same way. So I'm just going to pin this smooth 
at the hem here. And then where the center back seam like meets up, I will just slip stitch it shut like a pillow. Uh, once again, for the eighth hundredth time this video, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> I'm just gonna press this like so, and then I'll slip stitch this opening shut. And this will have this pleat in the back, which I'm going to do it differently on the silk version, but it will still look nice enough for this. Very Batwing inspired jacket, this whole thing. Like so. Trying to get my points to behave. Be nice. All right, so we have most of a jacket. It's very exciting. However, we have not talked about the collar at all. I didn't even do the pattern drafting for it. I've done a lot of, I've, I've drafted many a stand collar here on the channel. You basically, you measure the neckline of the back and the front pat pattern pieces, and then you just draft the collar based on that. I'll go ahead and insert how to do the collar in the silk version of this later uh, this month, but reference other videos of mine. I will link in the description below one of the videos where I actually show how to draft a collar. But a stand collar is a stand collar is a stand collar. They're actually not at all difficult. It's mostly a straight line. As you can see, it tips up slightly at the front, um, like a tiny, tiny bit, but Mostly this just goes out to the front of the jacket here. And I'm gonna sew the right side to the right side here and then leave the lining of the collar free. And I'll turn that cleanly on the inside once we have this secured to the rest of the jacket. But I'm going to sandwich all the layers of the jacket in between these collar halves, as it were. Pin this all down and then I will sew this over on the machine You've seen me do a couple of stand collars recently. I made one in the blouse from last week. So, you know, lots of stand collars in my life. They're very easy to do compared to other styles. So that's why I do them most of all. And I just like the style, of course. And I was out of bobbin thread. So I'll pop a new black bobbin in here before I can stitch this on half inch seam allowance as always. All right, so once I have that on, I can go ahead and clip this because again, the neckline is curved. So it's best really to clip this. Sometimes I accidentally skip it, <laughs> but you really should, should clip it. And then I'll turn the lining of the collar in on itself. You can see I did interface both sides of this collar. You can really get away with interfacing, interfacing one side of it, but extra stiff here. Seeing as this is a jacket, I didn't mind having a little bit of extra structure, but I'll just turn the inside of the collar down a half inch and it'll cover up all of our seam allowance, grubby clips and nonsense in here. So we have a nice smooth inside along the collar, and then I will just go ahead and slip stitch this down by hand off camera, apologies. But I do find that doing these little stand collars offers a very clean finish here, which I do quite like. Um, you can top stitch this also instead of having to hand stitch it, but for this jacket, I decided to go ahead, and hand, go ahead and hand stitch it. I grabbed two cotton shoulder pads from moodfabrics.com. This is the five layer cotton shoulder pad. I can go ahead and link these below. And then I just covered it with some scrap of the lining. Um, I just take a square piece of fabric and sandwich the shoulder pad in between it and then serge around the edges. Again, this is not done very fancily. I have done shoulder pad covering here on the channel before. Um, not recently. I meant to put the shoulder pads in between the jacket and the lining layer this time, but I forgot for this particular jacket. I'll do it on the next one. I tried the jacket on to see where I wanted my sleeves to be and then pinned the lining and the sleeve hems and hand stitched those. And then I'm just going to set my matching shoulder pads here into the shoulder. I like to mark the center of the shoulder pad with pins so I can feel it as I go about this and I'll just pin them into place, try on the jacket one last time. And then I will tack these at the shoulder inside the puff here and then along the um, like neckline area where the shoulder pad interacts with the neckline, I guess. It comes nearly to the neckline. So I'll just tack that here and up here. And then it was time to finally embellish this jacket. So to do this, I'm going to do this the exact same way that I did the cicadas down the back of my Victorian day bodice. Um, I will link that video in the description as well. Once again, I need way more cards for my mammothly long videos than YouTube offers. You can only have three cards per video. So I will put a link to my cicada gown day bodice video below um, to the minute where you need for this kind of embellishment. But I'm going to draw on the shape I want for my little appliques, basically. I have two layers of shantung here and I'm running them through the machine, but I like to draw on the shape I want in the middle of a rectangle. That way, again, I have all this fabric to work with. 
Um, if you just try and do this with like the seam allowance of the weird shape, it's really irritating. So I highly recommend doing the shapes like this, leaving yourself a little opening, which I'm going to leave one of the straight edges of my bat here open so that I can turn it right side out, but just cut it out afterwards, like stitch it first and then cut it out like I'm about to do. I'm going to cut this with a very narrow seam allowance. That's probably a little over an eighth of an inch, but I'm just going to cut out my bat here like so. Yes, these are little bat inspired floopies to go down the back of this jacket today. I did mention back when I did the skate gown that I wanted to try this detail on a regular blazer and today is the day. And I almost looking back at that cicada gown footage, I wish I had done more cicadas because today I'm about to do, I don't even know, I think it's like eight uh, bats down the back of this. I'll have to count in a minute. I forget. I wasn't counting at the time, but I'll turn this right side out again. I clipped my corners. I used the knitting needle as best I could to get my things to be pointy here. And then this little opening along the straight edge, I will fold those edges in on themselves, uh, pin this, and then I can slip stitch this invisibly shut by hand. But you can stuff some stuffing in here and have a very tiny pillow if you wanted to. Yeah, basically that's what we're doing here. A very weird shaped flat pillow. I'll slip stitch that shut. I made three different sizes for the back of this. So I have one large one and one, two, three mediums, and then two, no, three smalls. Yeah, so seven total bats, it seems. I don't remember what I'm up to, but I'm gonna pin these along the center back here. Again, I'm not measuring this. I'm just eyeballing it. If it comes out a little bit organic, I don't mind. Um, but I'm gonna pin this uh, with like a channel down the center back because I need to tack these on so that there is an opening in the middle of these. That's why they have this little, that's why these have this narrower area in the middle because eventually I'm going to run a ribbon of shantung down the center of this to create a kind of spine like effect, which you'll see in a minute. So I need to leave space for that. So I'm going to tack down right where I had put those pins, either side of the bat on either side of the center back. Hopefully this makes any sense. Once, once again, luckily you're watching me do this so you can get an idea of what the heck I'm doing by seeing it as opposed to me actually narrating with any sense of <sighs> clarity. Here's how we're looking so far. Then I have this ribbon of shantung. This is just a spare piece of shantung cut on the straight grain. And then I pulled the edges so that it was like frayed on purpose. So I pulled the edges into a fringe basically of this. And this ribbon is maybe a yard long and maybe four inches wide, I think. And I'm just gonna thread this through the back. Now you can thread this through in many different patterns uh, in many different ways. Um, so I was just trying to figure out how I wanted to knot this down the back of these bats. I ended up looping it like so here at the top. And then I was puffing out the knot over my bat, getting it to sit nicely like so. So I'm going to go down through the next bat like so, kind of floof things around until it's like I like, and then come back up and down again under that same bat. So each bat gets a little puffy loop around it like so. And again, if you use like a faux fur or a some sort of like fringy fabric or something fuzzy or furry to do this, it would really look like the bodies of the bats, which would be quite cute. But today I'm just using a matching one to create a kind of spine-like effect, which of course is inspired by this extant gown at the Met Museum, which inspired the costume designer for Crimson Peak who made this gown in the middle, which inspired me to do this on my Victorian costume, which inspired me to do this on this jacket today. So it's a series of inspirations going back to the 1870s when that gown was originally made. I've never seen another gown uh, from like another historic gown with this same detail. Uh, there's just that one at the Met. We have to assume that that dressmaker and that person who wore it were just very innovative and cool because what a cool detail down the back spine like this. It looks so skeletal and goth and I love it, especially when with bats here. And of course you could do various different designs as I mentioned in that cicada video. I mean, the last time I did this, I did cicada winged shaped I think it would be very cool with butterflies we may do in the future or like actual bone shaped pieces. Lots of very cool opportunity for design options back here. But once I reach the end of this, I just cut this into sort of like a peaked ribbon finish like so. And then I'm going to tack this ribbon down just at the top to this top bat and then at the bottom to the bottom bat. Otherwise it's going to stay in place. Like it's not like the wind is going to blow those out. Each one is tucked under each bat twice. So these little knots should stay 
just as they are. I might have to puff them up every once in a while from leaning back on things while wearing the jacket. But in general, it should stay pretty much like I put it in there. And if I ever need to clean this jacket, like I'll be wearing a layer underneath this to like next between my body and the jacket. So hopefully it won't get a lot of perspiration on it or anything. And if I ever spill anything, I would probably lean towards spot cleaning this, although it is technically probably washable. I might dry clean this if I ever need it to though, because uh, even though it's polyester, the inner linings and all this stuff going on here in the back would probably just do better with some dry cleaning, but I would probably just spot clean this jacket anyway. So, but I'm going to puff up the edges of each bat and then tack down the tips of the wings down the center back like this as well. And with that, this jacket will be finished. And here is my finished black strandtongue batty backed jacket. That's right, it's batty backed. I mean, there's bats down the back. You know, what are you gonna do? I think this will work so well with so many of my skirts, either my, you know, faux patent kind of skirts and faux leather skirts and sparkly shiny fabrics I've been working with lately, but also for daytime with wool skirts, with my gray pencil skirt, my red pencil skirt, black pencil skirt, things like that. This is gonna be a very versatile piece in my wardrobe, even if it is a little bit extra with all that's going on down the back. I am just thrilled with the way the back of this looks. I mean, the front is fun, but the back truly is where all the magic is happening with this jacket. I'm so pleased with how the pattern fit overall. I only had a few very minor changes to make to the pattern before I used the same pattern for my final jacket, and you will see those tweaks when we get to the final jacket. But before I dive into the final version of this Mandragora suit jacket, I have to make the skirt that matches. So I'll make a coordinating taffeta skirt, again, a one other wearable mock-up next week, and then make the silk version as well. And I will show you the results of that playing around making the taffeta skirt. I've had a lot of difficulty with taffeta skirts in the past, and I finally cracked what I was doing wrong. So I will talk about that next week. And thank you as always for watching today. And thank you to my patrons for making my projects possible. I'll be back here with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.